Hello, I'm Rowan Williams from Magdalen College, Cambridge, the college that C.S. Lewis belonged to in the last few years of his life. In fact, just a few days ago, I was sitting in the room that Lewis used to occupy in college, and rather hoping that I'd get some of his inspiration for the remarks I was going to make today. Lewis wrote quite a lot about pictures of God, images of God, and the difference between the comfortable ones and the truthful ones. He said at one point that he remembered when he was a young man coming to the conclusion that God didn't exist, but at the same time being very, very angry with God for not existing. It's a very odd thing to say, but as he goes on to explain, what he meant was that the God he was angry with for not existing was the God who would solve all his problems, the God who would do what he, Lewis, wanted him to do, the God who didn't complicate matters by having a mind of his own, ideas of his own, and purposes of his own, to which we had to accommodate ourselves. So, quite a lot of what Lewis writes about in his Narnia books and elsewhere is about this transition from the God who's really just a fairy godmother fulfilling our wishes to a God who is real and therefore can be quite threatening. One of the themes that keeps coming up in the Narnia books is that we can sometimes experience God as threatening just because he's so different, just because he's not a mail order God, not a God that we thought about, decided what he ought to do and then appointed to the office, to the vacancy in our minds and our hearts. And I think that's partly why Lewis in the Narnia books gives God the form of a lion this strange, wild animal, not part of our own tame, comfortable world, not within our comfort zone. That's what Lewis is trying to get us to come to terms with. God springs out at us, God surprises us. And it's not at all an accident that Lewis entitled his own autobiography, Surprised by Joy. He hadn't expected to be overtaken, grabbed by God, and he certainly hadn't expected to discover in God a joy that he could never have imagined for himself. And that's another of the great themes of Lewis's Narnia books. In God is joy, not the joy we might expect and hope for for ourselves, but something very strange, something we have to grow into and get used to, but which, when we've got used to it, is far more enriching, far more exciting, exhilarating and stretching than anything we could have imagined for ourselves. And that links in quite a lot with the way the New Testament itself works. The Gospels are always full of the statement that Jesus did or said this or that to fulfill prophecies, as if everybody had really been expecting what was going to happen, and when it did, people said, there we are, that's exactly what we expected to happen. But actually, if you read the stories carefully in the Gospels, you'll see that the way Jesus fulfills the promises is in fact shocking, difficult, and surprising. In spite of all the prophecies, people don't quite anticipate what it's really going to be like. Jesus can say, well, it's in the scriptures that when the Saviour comes, when the Messiah comes, there'll be suffering, there'll be conflict. And people as it were say, oh yes, yes, we understand all that. And then it happens. Jesus fails. Jesus is condemned to death. Jesus goes to the cross. And when it happens, everyone says, that's not at all what we expected. And Jesus says that after his death, he'll be raised from the dead. And you'd think once again, on Easter Sunday morning, everybody would be delighted saying, of course, we knew it was going to happen all along. But what do we see in the stories? We see surprise and shock once again. We didn't know it was going to be like this, people say, and they don't quite know what to think or feel about it. Now, Lent is a very good time for looking at our pictures of God, our images and expectations of God. It's a very good time for trying to let go of what I called earlier the mail order God, or the fairy godmother God, the one who just fits in with our agenda, who just solves our problems and fulfills our wants and wishes. The journey of Lent, the journey through the desert with Jesus, is a journey towards truth, towards the real God. And so it involves letting go of a lot of things and letting a lot of pictures and images be broken a time for breaking images, breaking idols, you might say, so that we get that little bit nearer to the truth. The self-denial involved in the period of Lent isn't just about giving up chocolates or beer or whatever. 
It's about trying to give up a certain set of pictures of God which are bound in to our own selfish wants, our own self-serving ambitions, our own fantasies. Jesus in the desert, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, looks towards God and there's nothing there that will solve a problem, nothing there that will sweep away all the questions. What there is is truth and love and patience and changeless welcome. In due course that will transform us. It will bring us to joy. It will make our problems, as Lewis said in another place, fade away. But first of all, we have to get used to a new climate. We have to breathe a new air. It's like being up in the mountains, another great image that Lewis uses in the Narnia books, being above the clouds, breathing a new kind of air, the air of the Holy Spirit, and getting used to the idea of a God quite different from what we expected, and yet at the same time ringing bells with what we most care about and most deeply long for. And here's just one passage from the Narnia books which brings that out very, very vividly. It's from the silver chair, and the little girl Jill is stranded in Narnia, feeling very thirsty. She can see a river and wants to drink from it, but by the river is a lion, and lions, everyone knows, are dangerous. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she'd come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. 